uh, this poem is by Adrian Rich. It is called Storm Warnings. It's one of the first poems that Rich wrote. She was 20 when she wrote it. Um, a bit of background information on Adrian Rich. She is an American poet. She uh, was born in 1929, is still alive, I think. Uh, she's one of the leading American poets of the 20th century. Um, and she had various themes in her poetry, uh, her relationship with language, power, sexuality, feminism, different things like that. She was a political activist as well. Um, she was married, uh, she's married young enough, um, and she uh, had two kids and then her marriage fell through, her husband committed suicide and she then later on and I realised that she actually um, was a lesbian as well. So she had a, an unusual life, a tough enough time and you can tell that from her poetry. I suppose most poets had something unusual or trying in their lives that they had to write about. So Storm Warnings was one of her first poems as I said, she was 20 when she wrote it and um, it shows that, that Adrian Rich was in a state of unrest. Uh, the Civil War was going on when she wrote it, there was a feminist movement going on that she was involved in. Uh, so the fact that it's Storm Warnings tells us that it's going to be about the weather but we can kind of guess from studying poetry for so long now that it has a deeper metaphorical meaning and that there's actually a storm inside of her as well. So I'm going to read it as I would usually do in class and I'll go through it as I usually would. Storm Warnings by Adrian Rich. The glass has been falling all the afternoon and knowing better than the instrument what winds are walking overhead, what zone of grey unrest is moving across the land. I leave the book upon a pillowed chair and walk from window to closed window, watching boughs strain against the sky and think again as often when the air moves inward toward the silent core of waiting, how with a single purpose time has travelled by secret currents of the undiscerned into this polar realm. Weather abroad and weather in the heart alike come on regardless of prediction. Between foreseeing and averting change lies all the mastery of elements which clocks the weather and weather glasses cannot alter. Time in the hand is not control of time, nor shattered fragments of an instrument, a proof against the wind. The wind will rise. We can only close the shutters. I draw the curtains as the sky goes black and set a match to candles sheathed in glass. Against a keyhole draught, the insistent whine of weather through an unsealed aperture. This is our sole defence against the season. These are the things that we have learned to do who live in troubled regions. So I'll go for stanza one at the minute. Um, I'll go through stanza by stanza and hope that... Ooh. Ah. Okay. So at the start we can write in at the title there, the storm warnings, uh, it is both actual and metaphorical. So put that in your books as well, that is actual and metaphorical, the storm warnings. Um, literally she's talking about a storm coming on, that the glass or the thermometer picks up on the storm, but she's talking about one inside of her as well. So I'll go through stanza by stanza. The glass has been falling all the afternoon and knowing better than the instrument what winds are walking overhead, what zone of grey unrest is moving across the land, I leave the book upon a pillowed chair and walk from window to closed window watching boughs strain against the sky. So the glass has been falling all the afternoon. This refers to the thermometer that she's seeing or barometer or whatever that's telling her that there's a storm on its way, the temperatures are dropping. And knowing better than the instrument. She knows better than the instrument. She's been there before. What winds are walking overhead. What zone of grey unrest is moving across the land. So we'll underline the word unrest there. We know it's uneasy. She's not happy in this storm. It's not a comfortable kind of feeling. I leave the book upon a pillow chair and walk from window to closed window, watching boughs strain across the sky. 
or against the sky rather. Uh, now we'll go back up here to the winds are walking overhead. What winds are walking? We've got a couple of poetic techniques there. We've got our W, so we've got sim or alliteration. And if the winds are walking as well, we've got personification. Stick them in there. What winds are walking overhead? What zone of great unrest is moving towards the land? Um, and the fact that it's unrest and it's moving across the land means that the storm isn't just a change in the weather, it's not just a drop in the temperature, but it's an unstoppable and uncontrollable force, the fact that it's moving across the land. And she tells us how comfortable she was. She was comfortable, she's reading a book on a pillowed chair and she walks from window to closed window watching boughs strain against the sky. So we have this sense of uneasiness from Rich here that this storm is on its way. She's expecting, she knows what's coming and she is um, leaving her comfort to go and check it out. Stanza two, she says, and think again. So we continue on from stanza one. There's enjambment there as well. Building up, uh, I suppose building up towards the kind of, not the excitement of the storm, but the energy of the storm, the enjambment reflects that. So we go from stanza one into stanza two, she says. I leave the book upon a pillow chair and walk from window to closed window, watching. We've got more alliteration there. Bows strain against the sky. I like that word strain there, it goes with the unrest. We could use that in an essay. Uh, very, very uneasy. And think again as often when the air moves inward toward a silent core of waiting. So she's thinking again as often when the air moves inward towards a silent core of waiting. So we know that we're moving in towards her now. How with a single purpose, time has traveled by secret currents of the undiscerned into this polar realm. Undiscerned means you can't really understand it. You don't know it in the mind. Whether abroad and whether in the heart alike, come on regardless of prediction. Now, in stanza two, we know that she's been through this storm several times because she uses the word again and she uses the word often. Um, and a very, very important sentence in this stanza and in the entire poem is here in the middle or at the end of the stanza, which is actually kind of slot bang, well, almost in the middle of the poem. And it signifies a change. It moves from the weather to an interior state. And on this side I'll say, but neither can be controlled. Whether abroad, outside, and whether in the heart alike, come on regardless of prediction, no matter what you predict. The weather is going to happen. The storms are going to are going to come. Now the next stanza. Between foreseeing and averting change. So we do all we can. We see it. We try and change it. Lies all the mastery of elements. So a mastery of elements there signifies some control. Has she got some control over it? Which clocks and weather glasses cannot alter? Time in the hand is not control of time, nor shattered fragments of an instrument, a proof against the wind. So here we have shattered fragments, which are similar to the strained and unrest up there. They're images of destruction and violence. And proof against the wind, not shattered fragments of an instrument, a proof against the wind. The wind will rise, we can only close the shutters. So when I was reading that through the first time, 
the rhythm changed entirely when I got down here to we can only close the shutters. There's a lot of enjambment, there's a lot of rise in action in the poem and then it comes to this, okay? So we see the storm, we see angst, we see unrest and strain, we see shattered and fragments and we see again and often that it's happening all the time. And she builds up to this and tells us there, there are storms outside, she has storms in her and then all of a sudden she says there's mastery of elements, perhaps there's some control, but then she changes down here and says we can only close the shutters. That's all we can do. It shows that we have a need for escape. Okay, so I'm going to bring it out here. Need for escape. But at the same time, it seems a little bit pathetic. It's an inadequate response. And I think it speaks wonders about the poet. We can only close the shutters. I think it speaks wonders about the poet. I don't know, pathetic's not a very nice word to use. We'll say inadequate response. To the storm. All she does is close the shutters at the top. First stanza, she says, I walk from window to closed window. She's watching from behind the windows. Here she's only closing the shutters. It's all that she can do. The storm will still go on. Final stanza, she says, I draw the curtains as the sky goes black and set a match to candles sheathed in glass. The fact that she needs candles to burn shows us the power. of the storm. Perhaps that her electricity has gone out, that all the light has gone out, metaphorically and literally. So I draw the curtains as the sky goes black and set a match to candles sheathed in glass against the keyhole draft. So even though the draft is only a keyhole draft, it's still important enough for her to write about. The insistent whine of weather, insistent there would go along with again and often, that is constantly there. And if you're thinking about this metaphorically, that this is whatever storm is brewing inside her is is pushing at her, is, is constantly there. The insistent whine of weather through the unsealed aperture, the keyhole. This is our sole defense against the season. She uses air now. So we're all in this together. We all have these storms. And our sole defence against the season. These are the things that we have learned to do. So she's speaking to us, her, her listeners or her readers. But she's also speaking about herself and her people. Who just literally weathered storms. They were just used to having storms in their region. But metaphorically, it's, they're very important. Two lines there. They tie the poem together. They express the literal progression of the storm and the acts to be taken when in a conflicted situation. Um, this is our sole defence against the season. These are the things. Now, that's storm warnings. If you've got space anywhere at the side of your books or even in a notes copy before you start taking down your notes uh, from the PowerPoint, um, if you can write this in, that the use of organisation And the organisation there is her four stanzas with um, seven lines in each. The use of organisation and the detail. Help to reveal the dual meaning of the poem. She, express, she expresses, or the speaker would say, the speaker expresses the literal fears that come with a storm.
So the speaker expresses the literal fears that come with a storm. But also the hesitations and need for refuge. But also the hesitations and need for refuge against troubles of the heart. So the use of organisation and details help to reveal the dual meaning of the poem. The speaker expresses the literal fears that come with the storm, but also the hesitations and need for refuge against the troubles of the heart. Um, her language is very conversational and precise in the poem. Uh, very straightforward. And it's a very nice poem. Very easy to understand, I think. Uh, I've gone through that very quickly. This is my first time using the visualizer so it's a bit weird and I'm not looking forward to hearing my own voice back but anyway hopefully it will help you understand the poem a little bit better rather than just reading the notes. Things that we have learned to do who live in troubled regions you just get on with it there's nothing you can do to stop it. 